Fantastic. So we're recording now. Everybody, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this uh, webinar. Um, can <laughs> Uh, the title, I loved the title this time, um, Can You Afford to Be Sick? Uh, it really is about uh, making sure that you're financially healthy so that in case you're not physically healthy, you can take care of yourself. Um, so I'm really looking forward to the conversation with Julianne and, and Jeffrey um, from uh, Howell Financial under the Sun Life umbrella. Uh, it's always fantastic to have you both here. Um, talking to the community and uh, giving uh, your perspective and your guidance around financial matters. Um, I, I'm going to turn it quickly over to you. Uh, but before I do, uh, thank you to uh, everyone who's in attendance and watching this video. Um, we are, are super excited to, to host this series um, all around uh, as part of the QD Care uh, program, uh, taking care of the holistic member, everything from mental health and well-being to financial health. Um, so again, uh, very much welcome. Uh, if you have any questions today for, for the uh, presenters, feel free to put them in the chat. Diego here will be um, managing the room and uh, he's from our architect team. Um, say hi, Diego. <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, if you have any questions at all or would like to, to get in touch with either myself or Diego, feel free to put it in the chat. Um, you can always reach out to the Queer Tech team. Um, my email is andy at queertech.org. Um, with that, uh, Julian, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to you. Uh, feel free to share your screen, make sure that we can see everything. Perfect, fantastic. And then I will let you take it away. I will put myself on mute. Actually, I'll, I'll kick off the, the presentation. Thank you so much, Andy. Uh, it's always great to be here. Um, so uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, uh, my name is Jeffrey Wu. I am a uh, certified financial planner licensed in uh, uh, Quebec, Ontario, and BC. And uh, as, along with me is um, Julian Vallat, who is uh, a financial security advisor and a responsible investment specialist. Uh, so we uh, partnered with uh, QueerTech to create this uh, this uh, uh, QT Care uh, series uh, uh, focused on financial health. Uh, but begin uh, before before I begin the, the presentation, I, I do want to uh, talk a little bit about like why we are doing this. Uh, so so both Julie and I we are proud members of the, the LGBTQ2 plus community. So we know firsthand that even if the time has changed and the society is progressing, a lot of us still don't feel comfortable talking openly about our personal finances to a professional. Uh, because talking about personal finances means talking extensively about our personal lives. And we know as professionals that lacking authenticity in these conversations usually means you won't get properly advice and bad advice or no advice creates significant barriers in achieving your financial goals. Uh, and this in turn will jeopardize your overall well-being. So that's the, the main reason that motivated us to create this program with QueerTag. And also uh, QueerTag's mission of breaking down barriers and empowering its members is like deeply resonating with us. Uh, like we, we are excited to be the partner of choice for helping you achieve financial security and planning for your wealth journeys moving on. So to achieve that, uh, Julian, can you quickly go back to the first slide? actually the first one. Uh, we designed the uh, six quarterly presentations about different topics like in like uh, financial planning. We already did two. Um, and by the way, they're all recorded. You can you can easily go to uh, uh, queer tax uh, sites, go to uh, QT care and find all the recordings there. Uh, they're both they're in English and in French. Uh, and we know that most of you uh, watch it afterwards. So like, feel free to let us know by email or to contact us if you have any, any questions. Um, so today, for today's uh, uh, webinar uh, is uh, specifically about protection. So it's, it's the, the, the title is, Can You Afford to Be Sick? Uh, Being Financially Prepared for the Unexpected. Um, so Julian will be talking, talking uh, mostly about the, the today's topic, but before that, I do want to uh, uh, quickly uh, do a recap. By the way, a legal disclaimer, like this is uh, uh, just read it. <laughs> and uh, uh, for the, the, the recap is to first talk about the, 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 the first webinar, what we did, 
was talk about a little bit about financial planning in general. Like how, how, and why do you need to have a financial plan and how do you think about it? And when do you need to engage with a professional to help you? So we did talk about uh, several, like uh, 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 the, 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 the flow of your thinking when it comes to building your wealth and investing. Uh, the first is you do need to have a, that like define your goals to quantify them into dollar amounts. And because of the, the time span of your goals, you need to understand the risks of your investment to achieve those goals. And I know that most of the Queer Tech members are young and uh, it's, it's wonderful. Like for the world of investment, the best asset you can have is the time. So start early automatically, even if just like $25 per week, uh, you, if you do it regularly through a, through a long period of time, you will benefit greatly from the, the, the magic of compounding. Um, it's important to organize your savings and investments carefully to, to have a list of your assets, liabilities, to understand uh, the, 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 what kind of investor profile you have, and then to assess if the, the investments you are doing can meet your immediate or medium long-term goals. Uh, we did ex extensively talk about the tools and the, the types of accounts you can use. Uh, so for RSP, for TFSA, RESP, um, and if you still don't know what are they or how to use them effectively, please go back to the first presentation and you will have a very, very detailed explanation of different kinds of accounts and how to use them. Uh, and um, uh, of course, don't forget to diversify and uh, seek for help and guidance when you are not sure or you need a second opinion or when your situation gets more complex. The second webinar was mostly about investment. So it's about the, the investment uh, fundamentals. Um, and uh, we did talk about the difference between risk capacity versus risk tolerance. So risk capacity is more about how much risk you can take. And it is very factual depending on your goals and what you have. Uh, but there's also important, it's very important to acknowledge your risk tolerance too, because we all have different relationships to, with money and, uh, uh, and uh, we, everyone has a, to a certain degree, uh, risk averse. Uh, so, so in order to assess that, you need to back to your goals to see the time span, uh, meaning like how long the investments will be, when do you need the money, and, and also to have some scenario in, scenarios in your mind. Let's say, oh, like for the twelve month period, what is the maximum loss that you can, you can, we can, you can tolerate? Is it five percent, ten percent, twenty percent, twenty percent plus? Uh, and then you can uh, design a portfolio based on the the risk that you can take, and also uh, like that that won't make you very stressful. Uh, we also, uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about all of them, so go back to the second webinar uh, in case you missed it. We did talk about, because we, we, we work with so many clients and we review the hundreds, not thousands portfolios. Um, there are some common mistakes that we see all the time. Like the first one, try to outguess time the market. Second is that past performance doesn't mean future performance. Uh, the third one is a big one, letting your emotions manage your decisions. There's a whole realm of behavioral finance about that. And part of our job as financial planners or investment managers are to coach you on the, uh, the, the, the uh, behavior, financial behaviors to make you disciplined and to, to not uh, give in to your emotions. Um, some, you can be very, very uh, scared by the noises or the short-term events uh, especially like this year, Q1, like Q2, there are a lot of things happening in the market. You might be very scared, but it's very important to align uh, with your goals uh, and to think about it in a more, in, in, like put it into perspective uh, because like there are always things happening in the market. There's never a time that is normal um, and there's inherent volatility in the market. And lastly, like we see again, again, uh, like the prospect or clients that are investing uh, DIY portfolios or crypto or like that are not diversified at all for long-term or medium-term success. Uh, so, so it's important for you uh, to, to, uh, to care about diversification as well. 
Okay, so uh, that's the recap. Uh, if you found them interesting, go to watch the whole episode. <laughs> for we have the English and French one both on the Queer Tech website already. Uh, but today's focus. So by the way, this is the financial pyramid, which are the uh, the aspects that we usually talk about for a, for a financial plan. Uh, and today's focus is more on the non-controllable events, specifically uh, to about uh, health, about uh, healthcare expenses. Um, and uh, uh, the, the, for example, like becoming dependent, suffering self serious illness, becoming disabled, suffering health issues. And without further ado, I will uh, give the, the mic to uh, Julian uh, and he will uh, go into today's content. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, so first it was very important to do that uh, reminder like that Jeff did, because when we talk about health or when we talk about like, being like safer with your finance, you always start with what we call your first safety net. Uh, it's your emergency fund. And an emergency fund, we don't even have to talk about insurance at first. Like it's you being sure that you have a small amount of money. I mean, it could be a few thousand dollars uh, that is here, very accessible and that you could use in case of an emergency. So it's only for emergencies and you already have to build that, uh, that emergency fund because let's take an example. I, I know that like most of people are in tech, working in tech uh, at Queer Tech. So your computer, your laptop is like your main tool to work, right? And if tomorrow your laptop is dying, you have to change it. It may cost you like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, maybe like more than that, you need to have that money accessible. You need to be able to buy a new laptop because if you don't, you cannot work anymore. And that's why like emergency fund is so important. It's not only about health, it's about like everything, you need that emergency fund. That's why it's so important to save. And so it's, it's so important to know how to invest money. Um, and that's why like the first uh, uh, presentations we had are so important too. So your first wall, your first uh, safety net is that. Make sure to make it easily accessible. Don't invest it like uh, very aggressively. If you want to invest it, invest it something in something very like safe. Uh, and uh, well, don't invest it at all. And keep something like three, six times your monthly basic expenses. So that's to give you an idea, but it's different for everyone. And it depends on how you feel. But they leave us like keep an amount of money very accessible if you have any like health problem that is not covered by your insurances, uh, any problem in general that is an emergency, at least you have a first amount of money that you can use. Uh, just something very important at the end, like a credit card is not an emergency fund. Don't use a credit card or a credit margin or whatever you, you call it uh, as an emergency fund it must be cash. So it's really like, it doesn't impact your finance negatively. Basically it, it helps you go through that. That said, not everything can be solved by your own money. And that's the point of today's presentation. It's about building your protection plan to make sure that you can be financially protected. So why insurances? That's the first point. It's to protect your finances, of course, and insurance won't protect you against like health problems or accidents, but that will protect your finances against these big expenses, uh, these big health expenses more exactly. Um, it's to get a peace of mind basically. And when you're sick, it's to be able to concentrate on your recovery and not concentrating off your financial problems. So that's what a health insurance, what a insur insurance in general is made for. Health insurance, so for, for, for your health and insurance in general, the best practice that are first, you have to know what you already have. So I don't say that you have to know it exactly and you have to be a professional in insurance, know exactly what you have, but you need to know at least the basics, knowing what kind of insurance you have, what are you paying for? And from that, like from that first like 
uh, knowledge of your of your own insurance plans, then you can assess what you need to protect you better. And also you can assess what is your budget but because insurance is always about your needs to be protected and your budget, what you can afford. And for that, like be sure to ask for professional help. Um, we are here for that. We'll help you assess your needs. We'll help you assess your budget. And at the end, we'll also help you set up the insurances and review that regularly because of course, your needs will change over time. Your budget will change. And the point, it's always to be, to, to have the best coverage for your budget, okay? So first, let's talk about like the differences in insurances, in health related insurances, when your employee or when you're self-employed or a business owner, because that could have some, like there are some differences depending on your uh, status and your working status, basically. <laughs> if we talk about the basics, we all know public insurances, depending on where we are, if we're in Quebec, in Ontario, in BC, we all have access, I mean, when we are citizen or permanent residents, we have access to provincial insurance. We'll talk about uh, if you're not citizen or not permanent residents, I'll talk about it later in the presentation. But if you have access to provincial insurance, it means that you have access to basic medical and prescription drug coverage. We're lucky to have that, even if it's really limited. So you have to know it's limited. Like it won't cover everything. It's covering only a, cover, a, a percentage of the drugs. There's no ambulance coverage in, in Quebec, for example. There's no dentist. Uh, so you don't have to know it exactly. You don't have to know exactly what you're covered for, but you have to be aware uh, what are the, the things that are really not covered and that could be a problem uh, in the future for your finances. For example, disability, it, it, it's another problematic example for, for your public insurance. Employees, um, they will have what we call employment insurance because the employer is paying for that. It's the, the federal uh, employment insurance. So if tomorrow because of a sickness or because of uh, an accident, you're disabled, your doctor says you cannot go work, then yes, you will be covered on the short term, but you'll see it's pretty limited. So it will be pretty much half of your earnings maximum with a maximum of 600 uh, something a week and a maximum of 15 weeks. That's the max you can get out of it. And after 15 weeks, if your disability is long-term, you have some kind of help from the government, but it's very minimal. It's from CPP, so Canadian Pension Plan or Quebec Pension Plan, depending on where you are. Uh, but it's very minimal and you really have to be like completely disabled, like in bed uh, and you cannot do anything. Um, so yes, there is a base. It's important to know that we're lucky enough in Canada to have a base, but it's also important to know that we can do better and we can, we have to, uh, to make it better. And that's kind of a personal responsibility. So to get an upgrade from that, we all hear about group insurance. I'm sure we, we, you all heard about group insurance. Group insurance will be an upgrade to the public insurance. Uh, it will even replace public insurance for the drug part, for example, or depending on, on the province you are, it will give you like ambulance coverage, paramedical, dentist, travel insurance. Uh, we, we talk about a lot of uh, telemedicine these days, like you can access to a, to a doctor online uh, through your phone, etc. So that will be a really great upgrade, but not everybody can get it. First, employees will be most likely to have it only, of course, if your employer is offering it. Uh, so that will be when we usually have access to group insurance. If you are yourself a business owner or want to be a business owner, meaning that you will hire a team of people, 
then you can eventually at some point set it up for you and your employees. You have to be like minimum three, four employees for an uh, insurance company to look at you and offer you some uh, something. Uh, but it's possible even for small teams. Like we, we do it, uh, we did it before um, with, with Jeffrey. So we know it's possible. Just ask a professional, same. Um, and be aware that it's possible. For self-employed, it's a bit more complicated. Usually, I would say like nine, time, nine times out of 10, you won't be able to get a group insurance because you don't have access uh, to a group insurance. You don't have an employer, right? And you don't have a team with you that like, you, you don't have employees, you're not a business owner. You just work for yourself and you're, you're alone. In this case, you may be able to get a group insurance through your professional groups if you have one. For example, some lawyers that are self-employed in Quebec uh, will get group insurance through the Barreau du Québec. So look at that because that may be an option for you uh, even if you're self-employed. But most of the time, you won't have access to a group insurance and we'll see next slide what you can get on a private and personal level. Um, important facts regarding group insurance. There's no health questions. So that's very interesting for that, that the main interest actually is that if you are offered a group insurance, nobody will ask you health question. You can be sick, you can have like uh, previous disease, etc. Nobody will ask anything and you will be covered. Also, it's partially or fully paid by the employer when you're an employee and uh, they offer you like a, a group insurance. Sometimes it's fully paid. I know that in the tech industry, more and more, uh, the employer will pay, pay fully the group insurance because they want to be uh, really on top of it. Like they, they want to be uh, better than others comp other companies. Uh, and know that in Quebec, the group insurance is, is mandatory if an employer or even a professional group is offering it to you, you have uh, to enroll to the group insurance fully or partially, depending on your situation, if your spouse covering you, et cetera. But keep that in mind, most of the time in Quebec, group insurance is mandatory. In other provinces, it can uh, vary. So make sure to ask before uh, to avoid like um, surprises, bad surprises. Another way to get a, an upgrade, basically from public insurance, is to ask for personal health insurance. So what is the difference? It, it, it looks like group insurance, but it's pretty different because it's really a private complement to public insurance. Like you own it personally, the group insurance, you don't own it. If you quit your job, you don't have a group insurance anymore. If your employer decides to, to stop the group insurance, no more group insurance. But a personal health insurance will be something that you own personally and gives you the same kind of stuff. So better drug coverage, better like ambulance coverage, massage therapist, all that, like, et cetera. It will complement RAMQ in Quebec. So make sure to have RAMQ because if you don't have it, you cannot uh, have a private uh, personal health insurance. In other uh, provinces, uh, ask before to a professional because that they may have like other uh, rules. Who should get it? So everybody can get it if you have RAMQ in Quebec or, or depending on where you are, uh, but who should get it? So most of the time, self-employed people, that's the only option you have uh, to be better insured. It's to get a personal health insurance. So usually self-employed people, you should try to get a personal health insurance. Employees who don't have access to a group insurance, you can go for it too. Or a business owners, if you have a, a small team and you don't wanna offer a group insurance or you can't set up a group insurance because the team is too small or you've been refused by uh, insurance companies, you can uh, explain that to your employees or you can introduce us to your employees and, and uh, we can talk about like personal health insurance. That's uh, something very interesting uh, when you cannot afford or when you cannot get uh, group insurance. Um, important facts here, the health questionnaire will be mandatory most of the time for to have a good personal health insurance. So it, there's no guarantee it's accepted. Exception exists, you have some product that 
warranty you to get it without health questionnaire, but that's uh, a bit more expensive and the coverage is a bit less interesting. The price will depend on your age, like group age. And um, if a group insurance, insurance is offered to you, I repeat, you have in Quebec to accept it. I, I, I say in Quebec because in Ontario, in, in BC, et cetera, may be different, but in Quebec, if you have a group insurance offered to you, you have to accept it. So if you already have a personal health insurance, you can keep both, but usually it's better to go with the group insurance that is paid fully uh, by your employer, for example, or even partial. After like that's the, the main like the main upgrades you can have. So group insurance, personal health insurance, but we wanted to go like a bit further and show you like two situations um, and two products that will answer this situation that could be very bad on a financial level. The first one is a critical illness. Uh, critical illness most of the time is, is cancer, like a cancer that is life threatening. Um, we can talk about like to any other like kind of illnesses and the problem with a cancer or any kind of serious illness is mainly financial. Um, I mean, of course it's stressful. You have to uh, concentrate on, on your recovery and it could be like a, a big like uh, life-changing event. But you have to know, like some of the stats say that even if we have a lot of chances to develop a cancer in our life, like half of us will get, we'll get a cancer, will have a cancer. Uh, we are not expect to die from it. Like nowadays, and it will be like that even more and more in the years to come with the treatments, with the medicine, et cetera, like you won't die from it. So at the end of the day, if you used like all your uh, your personal savings or your retirement savings to help you go through it, then you may go back to zero, financially speaking, when you are like in your 40s, your 50s or later. That is why like critical illness insurance is very important. It's really to limit the financial impact of a critical illness. So you can really focus on your recovery and you don't have to spend basically your own savings and your own money uh, if you have a cancer, if you have a heart attack, if you have a stroke and, and many other different uh, diseases. So how, it, how it's working, it's basically, it's an insurance. So yes, you pay every month or every year, but you're covered for a lump sum of money that if you get, if you have one, or one of these diseases, that, that are covered, you will get that lump sum of money tax-free and you can use it as you please. So here, it could be to cover uh, health expenses that are not covered by your insurances or extra health expenses uh, to get a better uh, treatment. Or I've seen like couples, for example, using it to make sure that uh, the spouse can stop working for a while. Because if the spouse stop working, there's no more like salary for the spouse, right? And you're not covered for that. So that would be an help to uh, for the spouse or someone in your family, like a parent, a brother, a sister, to stop working and come help you during your recovery phase or during your treatment. Um, that is important for, of course, everyone, young or less young. Of course, if you're young, usually you have less savings. So it's even more important because that gives you at least an option to have a better treatment, to pay for more uh, expenses. And if you're an employee and if you have a group insurance, sometimes you have a critical illness coverage included in your group insurance. It's always interesting to know uh, because like I said uh, earlier, there's no health questions when you have a group insurance. So that could be very interesting. But still, if it's in a group insurance, you don't own it. So if you're an employee or if you're not an employee, business owner, self-employed person, make sure to look into critical illness insurance because you will 
only personally if you do it individually, if you do it like personally, you will own it and I will follow you, whatever job you have, whatever happened in your life, that will follow you all your life. And you know that you, we, you will always have a financial coverage in case of a serious illness. That's the point of critical illness. Now, of course, illness or accident or whatever happened and you have a big health problem, you may not be able to work, right? Earlier, we talked about uh, disability insurance and employment insurance on the short term. When you're an employee, that's great because on the short term, you know that the government basically like Canada will help you go through it financially. It's not the best, but at least there is some kind of base. Um, but it's always interesting to look at it on an individual level because if you start to make like bigger salaries and you really depend on that bigger salary, so depending on your budget, depending on what you spend, it's always interesting to look into a personal long-term disability insurance. So when we talk about disability, it's really that you cannot work. It could be a full disability or partial disability. You can work only half time, etc. cetera. Uh, but disability means that you cannot work. Um, and a disability insurance will give you a monthly income. So it's a, usually a percentage of your salary. Uh, and after a waiting period, since it's long-term, we usually start after like four months, for example, you will get a monthly income tax-free most of the time, and you can use it as you please. It's really like an income. You don't have to use it on health uh, expenses or whatever. You do whatever you want with it. If you want to save a part, you save a part of it. It's really like a, a usual income. And you have to choose that coverage very wisely because it, it could be very complicated. Like you have a lot of options. You have a lot of different prices, a lot of different coverages. That's why you have to get like professional help usually when you look into a, a long-term disability insurance um, to make sure that it fits your needs and that you can adapt it in the future, et cetera. So always ask professional advice for that. Uh, so you're sure that you're well covered and how you can get uh, a, a long-term disability insurance. Of course, you can get it on your own. Like we said, there will be health questions. It's a bit complicated sometimes to get it depending on, on your health, like the, your past on a, on a, regarding your health basically. But the interesting thing is that, again, like critical illness insurance, when it's personal, you own it. So it follows you all your career, right? Whatever job you have, if you're self-employed, if you're a business owner, all your career, you have that insurance that is following you. And sometimes you can adapt it depending on, uh, on your salary, et cetera. So it's always better, I would say, to own a, a long-term disability insurance. But if you're an employee, check with uh, your employer's uh, insurance, you may have a long-term disability insurance. Why is it interesting? It's because usually you have no health question, uh, but be aware that most of the time, even if it's a group insurance, you will pay for that long-term disability insurance and you will have to accept it anyway. Um, and you will lose it if you change employer or if the employer decides to cut it for whatever reason. So it's not your own when it's a group insurance. So that's why long-term disability, it's sometimes a bit too, uh, like we don't think about it. And especially when we're young, we think that we're invincible and we don't think about it. But today I wanted really to, uh, to make sure that you think about it. Second situation, we know that in Canada, we are like a lot of us are uh, newcomers to Canada or we are immigrants since many years, meaning that we have family visiting and the people that are uh, not immigrants anymore that are like citizens or that, that are, are born here, uh, love to travel. So we wanted to really 
talk quickly about what to do in this situation because again people don't really think about it but it's not always simple when you're not a permanent resident and when you're not canadian most likely you won't have provincial insurance or in quebec for example you may have only a part of it uh, but not being covered with uh, for, for drugs, for prescription drugs. Um, that could be like because you're an international student, you're on a work permit, or you have parents visiting, they're not covered either. So be careful. Your immigration status will determine like your provincial insurance and what you can get. And make sure to know what you have. Don't... Um, don't don't think that you're super well covered by 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 provincial insurance because sometimes you're not that said some people are absolutely not covered by their provincial insurance because you're uh you are in work permit for example and you're not covered or you're just a tourist and you're not covered in this situation you cannot have a group insurance very important you really if you are not covered by provincial insurance you cannot have group insurance. At least in Quebec, in other provinces, always ask. That will be my advice. Always ask. Avoid like bad surprises because some employers will tell you, yes, yes, you can be covered. And then if something happens, you will figure out that actually, since you don't have provincial insurance, you are not eligible for group insurance. So group insurance will refuse to reimburse you. So be very careful with that. In this situation, your only option is to get emergency only medical insurance. What we call emergency only medical insurance, it's, it means that it's only for emergency. You cannot go for a regular checkup to the doctor, like your annual checkup, et cetera. No, it's really if you're sick or if you had an accident, um, you can be covered uh, fully or partially. You can hear about like, sometimes we call that visitor to Canada insurance. We call that impatriates insurance. You have international student, students insurance. Same, ask to a professional, come, come ask us. Uh, it's better to ask, better to understand it. And um, it will be very important if you don't have any provincial insurance because you have to cover yourself. Like it could be thousands of dollars of expenses if you go to the hospital. So make sure you're, you're well covered. Usually there's no health questions depending on your age, but there are limitations and exclusions. So make like be very careful. If you have like pre-existing conditions, for example, that are not stable, you may have exclusions here. Um, and little note, side note, it's also that kind of insurance that we use for your family and friends. If you have family and friends living abroad, and they come visit you in Canada, that's the kind of insurance you need to get for them. Uh, so make sure you're well covered when you're not a permanent resident or not a Canadian citizen. Make sure like about what is your actual coverage and how you can um, upgrade it to, to, to be sure that you don't have thousand dollars to pay if you go to the, 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 the emergency room for, for the emergency. Now, for people who like to travel, um, it's always underrated. Like travel insurance is always underrated because I don't know, like we're always so excited uh, to go travel and we forget the basics and we don't, wanna, we don't wanna think about the worst basically, but it's important to, to think about it. And um, it could be just going outside of your province uh, and that we don't think about it often. Like if you go outside of your province, let's say you're in Quebec, you decide to go to Vancouver and you have an accident in Vancouver or you fall in the street and, uh, and you have to go to the hospital. RAMQ will cover, like RAMQ meaning the, the, the provincial insurance in Quebec will cover a part of your uh, expenses, health expenses in, in Vancouver, but the maximum will be what you would have paid in Quebec. So if for any reason, what you pay in BC is more expensive than what you pay in Quebec for the same uh, treatment, then you will have to pay out of pocket the difference. So usually travel insurance is advised when you go outside of Quebec in another province. Of course, the difference shouldn't be that huge. 
maybe a couple of hundred dollars. Uh, but still, like when you know that a travel insurance costs not that much, uh, especially when you stay just in Canada, think about it. Um, when it's outside of the country, you better be insured. Like it's not even thinking about it. You have to be insured, uh, especially like people in, in Vancouver, in Montreal, it's so easy to cross the border, go for a weekend in, in the US. Uh, that could be thousands of dollars out of pocket if you are not insured properly. And uh, we don't want to think about it, but it's so easy to just go for a hike, fall, and 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 have to go to the hospital, or have to call an ambulance. That will cost you like thousands of dollars. So in this situation, there is two steps. First step is to ask yourself the question, do I already have a travel insurance? If you have a group insurance, you most likely have a travel insurance. So check what are the uh, what is the, the length of the insurance? Like is it 30 days, 60 days? Uh, same with personal health insurance. Most likely you're covered for uh, travel insurance. Check if it's 15, 30 days, very important. Credit card, that could be a bit more tricky. Uh, credit card, I would like tell you to read the fine prints uh, because like sometimes it will cover you for a few days. Sometimes you think you're covered for your whole trip, but actually it's only for 15 days and you're there for three weeks. So be really careful, ask questions, read the contracts, uh, make sure of what are the um, exceptions, the exclusion, the coverage, uh, and ask to a professional, like ask questions. Uh, that's very important. If you're sure that you're not covered and uh, you need uh, travel insurance, then ask to an advisor, get one, get a travel insurance. Uh, even last moment, like try to get a, a travel insurance. It could be the day before leaving, no problem. Uh, and if you travel often, you even have options of multi-travel insurances. Very interesting, uh, that could be cheaper. So keep that in mind, travel insurance, it's so underrated, people forget about it. We think about going to the beach or going to see our family, think about, travel insurance, very important uh, to, to, to make sure that you're covered and you won't spend like thousands of dollars on something unexpected regarding your health. So now like we saw like basically a long list of how you could make your uh, insurance plan better, your coverage better. So for of, sure, of course you have your uh, own emergency fund to help with some stuff. Then you have your insurances. It could be like group insurances, personal health insurances. You have some kind of upgrade with critical illness, uh, long-term disability. So you have a good uh, idea now of what you should and what you could have. Uh, to finish that presentation, I wanted to take a few minutes and talk about insurances and our community, basically. Um, because things are evolving. Um, it's still like, there's still work to be done, but uh, things are evolving. And it's not only about health problem. Um, so I took a few examples that are, that are like the main topics that are evolving and that are um, touching our community, the LGBTQ community. Uh, First, you have medically assisted reproduction. I thought it was very important and very interesting to know that it's actually partially covered by provincial insurance. And there's a rule of no discrimination based on sexual orientation or marital status. Um, so very interesting to know that our government uh, insurance are covering us partially uh, for medically assisted reproduction. And interesting to understand, like if you have a group insurance, then that should be covered better than your provincial insurance, especially for drugs, for example. Uh, drugs will be covered better, like better coverage uh, percentage. Uh, and some of group insurances are covered you 100% for, uh, for drugs, for example. So very interesting, again, to see if you can have a group insurance or a personal health insurance uh, to upgrade what is already partially covered by provincial insurance. 
Nowadays, we also talk a lot about PrEP, same idea. It's partially covered by provincial insurances now. Uh, of course, you can ask if you want to know the details, you can ask to, uh, to run Q in Quebec or other insurance in other provinces. And same idea with group insurance or personal health insurance. It also should be covered better with a better percentage uh, because they have to cover at least what is covered by the provincial insurance. And usually the percentage is better. It could be like 80, 90, 100%. So ask, like ask to your uh, insurance company if you have a group insurance or personal, personal health insurance. Could be very interesting to know what you're covered for and how, for how much. About gender affirmation, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, public insurance, some procedures are already covered, uh, partially, I guess, too. For group insurances, more complicated. It's still rare. Some insurance companies will partly cover surgical procedures that are not covered by public insurance, um, but it's still an option that the employer has to choose when they negotiate the group insurance. So for now, we don't see it often. Us as advisors, we try to, to uh, make the employers aware of that option so they can know it exists and they can choose it. Uh, but yeah, it's still pretty rare. It's changing though, like that kind of uh, coverage in group insurances, we can see it only since, let's say a couple of years, one, two years. So I'm sure it will evolve, and, um, but there's still work to do. At the end of the day, always ask. That will be my main advice. Uh, when it's about group insurance, personal health insurance, always make a phone call, uh, talk about your situation, uh, talk about like, what, don't be ashamed to talk about your health like with your insurance company uh, because they will tell you what's covered, what's not, and they may, uh, like help you understand better. And um, instead of thinking that it's not covered, so I don't do it, always ask and uh, you may be surprised. So that's my main advice uh, today. I wanted to have a last slide on gender, on gender and, and health insurance. It's still a lot of work to be done uh, on that topic. For health insurance and insurance in general, insurance company will still ask you for uh, your sex at birth. Yeah, they should never ask for your gender. Like they will ask you for your sex at birth. Some of them, like some of the forms are, are still not updated. Some of them are still not trained properly. So they may ask you for gender, but um, it's sex at birth, what is important. And why? It's because there's an insurance like in the insurance industry, there is something called gender gap. It's, it's wrongly called gen, gender gap, actually. It's because the stats are influencing the premiums, so the price of the insurance. And your sex at birth will influence that premium because statistically, for example, for life insurance, it will be cheaper for a female at birth because statistically, a female at birth will live longer. That's it, that's how it is. It's changing slowly. Uh, we try our best to uh, make uh, life insurance, uh, to make insurance company aware. Um, yeah, so they will still ask, and you can see like for critical illness insurance, it will still be required to disclose your sex at birth. For group insurance, you can, exception can be made, so you don't have to disclose it if you don't want, like uh, just uh, uh, say that you don't wanna talk about it. Uh, for personal health insurance, from experience, it's still asked. There's no impact on the premium, but it will still be in the questionnaire. Um, so yeah, that's how it is. Uh, things can be better, and we hope it will be better, and we're working on it. Like as advisors, we, can, we don't have that much power, but we try to push as much as we can uh, group insurances and insurance in, in general, uh, insurance company in general, yeah. So Jeffrey, I will let you... Uh, conclude the presentation for today. Thanks, Julian. That's uh, very insightful. Even I learned something. <laughs> so um, uh, thank you for your attention today. Um, so I know insurance is not as sexy as uh, making money, uh, but I think any um, 
intact financial plan should avoid any situations that may ruin your finances. So, so um, like it's, a, it's especially when you are younger, it's a very good practice to pay for a smaller premium and then to uh, to transfer the risk to an insurance company to avoid these uh, unexpected events that could literally ruin your finances. So um, just to uh, pinpoint to several points that Julian talked about today, like of course, like we are a financial, like a, we are a financial a firm focusing on financial planning, holistic financial planning and investment management, but we are five, uh, fully licensed for, um, for insurances as well. Um, there are, uh, specific to this presentation, there are several, uh, uh, several uh, points that uh, like if you think it's interesting you can always you can always uh, uh, reach out to us uh, first is if you're an employer and you have you want to set up a group benefits for small business and usually it means more than three employees uh, if you're self-employed and uh, you are not uh, part of a group and you want to uh, like uh, set up a personal health insurance for yourself or if you know someone that could benefit from that from, from that uh, always let us know uh, critical, critical illness insurance and long-term disability insurance they are more complex than the health insurance itself so you definitely need some planning uh, so it, it requires uh, more than just looking at the brochures and to look at what is covered and you need to have a conversation to understand what is your, what are your insurance needs and how much coverage you need uh, so definitely reach out to an advisor if you, you you think these are important to you and lastly, um, travel insurance, no matter if it's inbound or outbound, no matter if you're here, you are not, you're not uh, um, uh, eligible for the provincial health care yet, or it's for family visiting and you want to make sure that the person uh, can cover any unexpected expenses while, while visiting you, uh, those are very easy to set up. Uh, you can easily shoot us an email. Um, that's about it. Uh, we are gonna. We have five minutes for Q and A. Uh, just to let you know that you can easily uh, uh, reach out to us by uh, on LinkedIn, or you can send uh, us an email. It's my email, but uh, like uh, if it, if Julian can help you, I will forward it to him. Uh, we are usually very responsive. You can totally send us any information, and we will respond uh, within twenty four hours. Um, and we look forward to uh, to talking to you in a very safe environment. Thank you. So I'm gonna open the floor. So if you have any questions, I know it's a it's a small group today, um, but feel free to ask. Because if it, if it's a private if it's private or if you want to discuss with us after the presentation, uh, I did. Uh, you can you can send me an email and I can I can uh, plan a time to talk to you as well. Uh, Diego, maybe stop the recording because that's. Uh,